Thank you, Jason. It's uh, great to be with you here today. It truly is. And to uh, be joining along with Captain Manning and uh, with Lynn uh, to discuss seamen welfare and, uh, and what's going on uh, from at least our point of view. Uh, but first, just let me say thank you. Uh, and, I, and I mean that a really heartfelt thank you uh, for all the outstanding work that every one of you in this room does and one to one extent or another uh, on behalf of the Maritime Ministry and to seafarers who sail under all flags and of, and of all nationalities and, and creeds. Um, and I include myself in that as a, as a seafarer. Uh, you owe us all, um, or we owe you all, I should say, a very great debt. So thank you uh, for what you do every single day. I'm very honored to be here uh, because your mission is very near and dear to my heart. Um, you take care of mariners. In that respect, we have a very common focus. Uh, the command philosophy that I've used in all the ships that I've had the honor and pleasure of commanding over the years and all of the um, shore sites and uh, even up right till today, uh, I've had a command philosophy that has three very simple tenets. The first tenet is take care of your people first. Uh, and I have preached that and taught that to uh, all of my crews and to all of the young officers who I've mentored uh, who are in line to take command of their own, take care of your people first. It's, it's the foundational bottom line tenet of command, tenet of leadership. And it's usually the very first one that gets forgotten. Um, so I think in that respect, we both kind of see eye to eye in terms of the importance of taking care of your people. And just for your information, the other two tenets uh, of my command philosophy are be a professional and be a good shipmate. So my, my philosophy is fairly simple. Take care of your people, be a professional, and be a good shipmate. I don't think it's any more complicated than that. And uh, pretty much everything else really kind of bends under those kind of three tenets. And uh, it served me pretty well. Um, I've explained it uh, wherever I've gone, wherever I've had the privilege of commanding. And it seems to resonate pretty well, whether it's uh, afloat aboard a ship uh, in the building at the Maritime Administration or even up at Kings Point to the midshipmen. And I make a point of going up there and standing in front of them every year and just reiterating uh, that and um, it's it's been heartening that they have kind of gone on and and taken that on board uh, and internalized it and come up with their own sort of uh, philosophy of their own that's called be King's Point. So all of them have kind of embraced this. You know, we are King's Point. We are responsible for our actions because, as you probably know, and some of you have, that watch the news in the industry, uh, there was all sorts of sexual assault, sexual harassment. Uh, sorts of issues that had been um, surfaced in, in years past, and um, uh, a lot of those were had not been reported because uh, there was a, a lack of trust there. Um, as, but as I told them, you know, if you're waiting for an edict from me or an edict from the superintendent or something to tell you to not do that anymore, we can issue paper all day long until you all decide that you're not going to stand for it and not. Uh, behave that way, it's going to go on. So it's really up to you. It's your problem to solve. And uh, thankfully, they have kind of embraced that. And uh, the culture up there is very, very refreshingly different these days. And uh, I'm very proud of those midshipmen for taking that on board and, and, and tackling that. I end up having to go and testify before Congress on, uh, on many occasions about this issue. It's got the Congress's uh, eye. And uh, uh, it's, it's been good that this year I've been able to go back and give them some good news finally that we're, we're on the right road to recovery. Uh, so that's important. Uh, you know, you saw my bio and you, you heard about it. Um, you know, I, I grew up, I was born and raised a block from the Atlantic Ocean. I, I was born in Atlantic City Hospital in Atlantic City, New Jersey, which is literally a block from the ocean front. So I like to tell people my first breath of air was salt air. And, uh, and I'm very proud of that. And uh, the sea really has kind of influenced my life um, from the very beginning. 
Uh, and growing up, I was very, very fortunate, and I didn't realize it at the time, I mean, what kid does. Uh, but as I've grown older, I've, I kind of realized that I was surrounded by a cadre of male relatives and, and role models uh, that, were, that were very special. Uh, every single one of them had served our nation, uh, and, many, and most of them in the sea services, either the Navy or the Marine Corps. Um, and a lot of our neighbors and a lot of our close family friends, you know, the kind of people that you call uncle, that aren't really your uncle, but you call them uncle because they're that close. Uh, you know, they, they all had served as well. And so that influence was, I was surrounded by that from an early, early, very early time. Uh, and while none of them was twisting my arm to go into the Navy or to go to sea, um, you know, it couldn't help but rub off. And, um, and I said, I, as I look back on it uh, now, it, it's, it's so obvious as to where I ended up, why I ended up that way. Um, and they're all God-fearing men. Uh, you know, we all went to church. Matter of fact, the church that I grew up going to was across the street from the hospital in Atlantic City. It was at the corner of Michigan and Pacific Avenue, Atlantic City, New Jersey, St. Andrews Lutheran by the Sea. Had a beautiful big picture of St. Peter, big mural on the side, uh, you know, uh, standing in front of a boat in front of the Sea of Galilee. Uh, so I guess that influence was even there uh, walking into the church. Um, but, uh, <clears throat> and then I lived right next door to the church in the Dennis Hotel, which my family owned and operated in Atlantic City. So my entire life for the first several years was within a block of another hospital, church, and the hotel where I lived. So, uh, so I was kind of, I think, destined uh, for the life that I ended up. And on top of that, you know, I, I, uh, I was lucky enough to have a boat from a very early, early age. When I was eight years old, I got my first vessel my first command, a uh, little 16-foot boat that uh, my parents could not pry me off. Uh, I was always on board it. I was always out fishing or, or cruising around. So I learned uh, the importance of, uh, of self-reliance and, and being at sea. And then when I had uh, friends with me about, you know, what a captain does and, and how to be a good captain, and, you know, I made some dumb mistakes, obviously, that, you know, you'd expect an eight- or nine-year-old kid to make. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I learned over time how to, uh, how to command and how to get other people to help you uh, do things and how lonely it could be out there when uh, you were out there by yourself and the seas kicked up and there was, you looked around and there was nobody around there uh, to help you. Uh, and that's where the prayer aspect kind of came in uh, real handy. Uh, but what followed from all that was, I think, a really truly wonderful career that uh, I was lucky enough to go to uh, a nautically oriented high school, Admiral Farragut Academy. I uh, used to be advertised in the back of Boys Life magazine all the time, but it was, it was speaking to me. It was getting me into uniform, getting me on ships and boats, and getting me ready for a life at sea. So I was all into that. So I put my first set of dress blues on when I was 14 years old and uh, was in them for another 42 years. So it was, uh, again where I was destined, but from Kings Point, or from Farragut, I went to Kings Point, did my time there, and then from Kings Point uh, off into my 34-year adventure into the Navy, working my way up the chain of command to uh, eventually command some incredible ships with some even more incredible uh, people uh, sailing with me uh, all over the world. Uh, so all during that time, uh, I did have a lot of opportunity to interface with probably your predecessors, in some cases maybe some of you, uh, in ports up and down uh, the East Coast and then overseas as well. And a lot of the foreign ports that we called on, um, there was uh, the port chaplains were something that I was grew up with knowing about uh, from an early early stage. So, so I kind of know you. I kind of know this group. I kind of know this organization. Uh, even if I haven't interfaced directly with uh, many of you. And I know that it's very well appreciated by this audience, probably more than any, uh, that life afloat these days is a whole lot different than it was when I started out uh, you know, over 40 years ago, uh, back in the 70s. I think it's true, I think that holds true for both uh, the Navy and especially so for the Merchant Marine. 
uh, and particularly, particularly for those folks that are trading internationally. Uh, and there's plenty of reasons for this, and you know you, you probably know them better than I do. But uh, from from what I see, you know, it's smaller crew sizes, it's longer ship assignment contracts, it's a, a lot less import time, more restricted time when you are import, uh, and more personal electronics uh, that influence both the way people interact with each other on the ship, kind of almost drives them apart to go be, watch their own show in their own stateroom away from the rest of the crew, uh, or if they're lucky enough to have connectivity while they're out at sea, to bring, bring problems from ashore out to sea, where now they're not in any real position to impact them or affect them, but they're now there in their minds and gnawing away at them and perhaps taking them, uh, taking their minds off of their business at hand, uh, which, you know, for those of you who have been to sea, know that uh, the sea demands attention. Uh, and there's, when you're talking about some big pieces of metal moving around in constant motion, you got to be paying attention. Uh, moments of inattention uh, can have a very uh, sad ending. So that aspect is out there too. And then, and often, uh, oftentimes, another factor is a very uh, culturally diverse uh, crew that uh, may not be as homogeneous as perhaps crews used to be. Uh, and I'm sure many of you can probably come up with many other factors that are causing, uh, uh, you know, things to be more stressful typically at sea these days and, uh, and, and oftentimes more lonely. Uh, I'm sure that drives a lot of people out of the maritime industry in this country. And uh, I know it does kind of in the Navy sometimes. Uh, and I guess they get driven out if, if they can leave even. There's many people that can't leave. They're in and they, and they got to stay because of their economic situation. So that adds a stress all into itself. And that, of course, impacts quality of life in a whole lot of negative ways. Uh, I know that in the Navy, in my experience, you know, we typically do a sailor uh, survey, a satisfaction survey every couple of years. And every, I think every year that I was in the Navy, all 34 years, the number one dissatisfier um, was separation from family and friends. Absolutely hands down by a long margin. Uh, it just eats away at people, and that's with a crew of you know several hundred people that you're interacting with them all the time. Uh, but your own family uh, is that special satisfaction or that special uh, uh, reason and, and, and uh, source of happiness. All this concerns me a lot. This sort of downward trend toward uh, happiness at sea, uh, for for a couple different reasons. Uh, first, I don't like seeing an industry. And a, and a way of life that I grew up in and that I cherish and love, uh, you know, becoming something to potentially be avoided and to having a negative connotation. I, I, it rubs me the wrong way. I don't like that. Because, uh, you know, we are, we are a maritime nation, at least in this country. And I think, uh, you know, Canada you can say that there and certainly Great Britain and some of the other countries represented here. We are maritime nations. This is what we do. We, we, we are on the water. It's it's uh, critical to our economies, and it's part of our national uh, being. Uh, and so, this this means that attracting and retaining new mariners can become kind of challenging. And we see that, uh, you know, as we uh, uh, I, I see that firsthand, as because part of my mission at Marad is to ensure that uh, we have a properly trained and equipped uh, maritime workforce to man our merchant marine. And that, that kind of gets me to the second part, and that is right now today as I stand here, we're facing a very significant manning shortfall, uh, which, which uh, impacts my ability to do my mission at, the, at MARAD, uh, one of my statutory missions of uh, providing emergency surge sea lift uh, for our nation's armed forces. Our armies and air force and, and major forces they, they, when they leave our shores to go someplace else in the world, it's on a ship and it's in a commercial ship. It's not in any some magic carpet or it's not in a, typically in the back of a Air Force transport plane. Uh, you know, they can carry a tank or a couple of Humvees at a time. When you have to build up combat power someplace in the world, it's got to be in a ship. And our entire, at least in this country, uh, 
plan is that that goes in a commercial ship. Uh, so we, I run 46 ships in the Maritime Administration that are owned by the government that are uh, sea lift ships, surge sea lift ships. They're in a five-day readiness status uh, sprinkled around the country. There's four of them right here in Baltimore. Uh, they're the gray ships with the red, white, and blue uh, stack stripes. Uh, but they're only manned by nine people. There's only nine people on those ships any given day just to keep the lights on and you know keep the rust from, uh, from disintegrating the ship. So they work pretty hard, but there's only nine of them on board. When we activate those ships, they have to be able to activate in five days to crew up to the full man and complement provisions, the whole works. Well, those people have to come from someplace. And they come from the commercial merchant marine. Uh, and as I sit here today and as we, as we are here to, today, I'm, uh, I'm here to tell you that I am 1,800 people short from being able to do that mission on a sustained basis. That's a lot of mariners. That's about, in U.S. manning terms, that's about 40 ships worth of crew that I'm short right now. Um, and I've had to testify before Congress about that. And I can tell you it wasn't the most pleasant conversation that I've ever had with another body of people. Uh, but you know, I have to, I have to kind of lay it out there so we can uh, hopefully do something about it. But uh, so, you know, so this manning issue, this uh, set of factors that's driving people away or out of the industry uh, is, has got some serious impacts to me and, and to our national security. And it impacts us right now, I mean, today. Um, so, so yeah, I do care a lot about the health and well-being of our mariner workforce, and, and I, I know you do too, uh, in, a, in an even more hands-on sort of way uh, than I do, uh, because that's what NAMA and its members are really all about. Uh, and I know that you don't, it's not just about U.S. mariners that you care about, but you know, more importantly for our foreign mariner guests that arrive uh, on ships all day long, the majority of them foreign flagged. I think you probably, most of you know the, the statistics, about 98 or so percent of all of our foreign, all of our commerce is carried on foreign flag ships. U.S. flag ships amount to about 2% of it today. That's it. Our, our 82, count them, 82 internationally trading deep draft ships is what our merchant marine is down to these days. 82. So, all, <clears throat> so the vast majority of them are foreign ships coming to our shores with foreign, foreign mariners um, manning them. And given, this, uh, given the port security restrictions that we all know about in this post-9-11 world, uh, it can be very difficult, if not impossible, for those folks to get ashore. Um, and I know for sure that uh, you, know, you all, especially port chaplains, uh, you know, you really are ambassadors for the United States to most of these people. This is the face of the United States that they see and really kind of get to know. So, you know, the services that you can provide for them, the connectivity, the connection, uh, you know, whatever it is you can do for them uh, can make a huge difference, uh, you know, in their lives. And I, and I know you know that, and that's, that's why I'm so grateful for what you do. Um, and as we have seen in the past, it's not so uncommon these days for uh, unscrupulous owners to abandon ships. Uh, it happens ridiculously frequently, uh, and we've seen some of that uh, occur in the not too distant uh, past. And Kate and I were just talking about that um, just a, a few minutes ago, where that's uh, that's happened, where they don't have, they're not paid, uh, the ships running out of food, and they don't have uh, money to to travel to get home, so they're just kind of stuck. Um, no clothes, no, you know, no nothing. So uh, the role that you play in helping those poor souls uh, deal with their situation is, uh, is really unparalleled. It still amazes me that in 2018 that, that still kind of goes on, but unfortunately it does. Uh, I could tell you that we at Marad are uh, grateful for the selfless service that you provide to seafarers of all nationalities. Uh, we encourage and support your programs of uh, your membership uh, that work to help our mariners' physical, mental, spiritual well-being. Uh, you are partners in that very important endeavor, and I'm here to tell you that we're partners with you as well. 
So your chaplains, your programs, your centers have made an enormous difference in the lives of countless thousands of homesick seafarers that many of you here today, along with the dedicated uh, fellow caregivers that are still out there doing the job, have helped and, and comforted throughout the years, and I would count myself amongst, um, amongst that crowd. So thank you again for, for all that you do and all that you have done, all that you will continue to do uh, for both those things that are visible and those things that we're never going to see, but those connections that you make, uh, that smile that you put on that face, that uh, sense of relief that you give uh, those, those folks that are looking for, uh, for a little help just for, or just for a little acknowledgement that they exist. It is so easy to be forgotten or to feel like you're forgotten when you're out there for such a long time uh, and no one seems to care. So, um, you know, the impact that you make on the hearts and minds of our seafarers is uh, magnificent. So I salute you. Please stay the course. I know it's not uh, always the funnest work in the world, but uh, keep up the good work, and God bless you all. Thank you all very much. I don't actually have a question, but I did serve on your vessels under the Marad. I am. Oh, thank you for your service. <laughs> You're welcome. How'd I do? Pardon? How'd I do? You did great. You, did, right, you have done uh, amazing things for our maritime community, and I want to thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Thanks for saying so. Anyone else have a question? Yes, thank you for all that you're doing for our um, fleet. Uh, I want to just, as a side, say that your legacy lives on at St. Andrew's Lutheran in Atlantic City. <laughs> they uh, continue to uh, provide Christmas at sea satchels uh, for oh, us at Seafarers International House um, because they're just down the coast a little bit exactly, from yeah. New York. So uh, it's it's always fun to pick up those every year and and see Atlantic City too. In the good, you know, I was a little kid. I I did some of the putting those things <laughs> together. So that's pretty neat. Uh, but I do have a question. You you had mentioned that the American fleet is is really quite small and and diminished. Um, and I'm not sure if you said 80 ships? 82 internationally trading ships, yes. And that we're down how many seafarers? We're down about 1,800 from where we need to be. And to what, one of the things, I, I believe you, I, I don't think you're making that up. That wasn't the number I made. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, but this is my first time to my tags um, to visit here, and I'm just so impressed with how many people are here other than us training and, and uh, obviously getting uh, prepared for, for service on ships. So it seems, like, um, uh, it seems like it's very healthy enterprise. Yeah, so the, the number, you know, 82 is a little bit misleading. So let me tell you the rest of the story. Okay. How's that? Let's probably answer your question. So 82 internationally trading large you know, 1,000 gross tons or larger vessel. These are ships that are out there trading around the world, okay? So that's that group of ships. Uh, we have 41,000 ships under U.S. flag that are in the Jones Act trade. They're doing domestic stuff. That's tugs, barges. There's about 100 large ships that are trading around the country, container ships between here and... Uh, Puerto Rico and Alaska and Hawaii, tankers that are running the Gulf and the East Coast and out of Alaska. So there's a hundred big ships like that that are doing domestic sort of trade that all have U.S. mariners, many of whom are here training, uh, 82 that are trading internationally, and you know a whole bunch of other smaller craft, tugs, barges. Uh, C. McAllister Towing is one of your sponsors, you know, a bunch of their ships around. So. But I, I count the big number, I, the 82 and the 100 big ships, those are the ones I care primarily about because those ships require unlimited tonnage and unlimited horsepower licenses to run the ships that I have, my 46 ships, and to run the ships that are going to be carrying the, the, our armies overseas. So those are the, that's where I'm 1,800 people short, and those unlimited tonnage, unlimited licensed kind of people. So hopefully that clears that up. Yeah. 
Yes, sir. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, there's just a question down here. Yeah. Then Ladies first, and then I'll get you, sir. Thank you. Just a quick, how is it being addressed then, or is there an avenue that's being taken to help get that yeah, number that, lower? Perfect question. Thanks for the setup. Um, yeah, that's, that's kind of my day job. That's what I do is try to figure out how to come up with 1,800 people. And what I, uh, I've gotten exactly the same question from members of Congress when I've testified, and I'll just tell you what I have sort of told them. It's all part of the shipping equation. In order to have jobs for mariners, which is what we need, in order to have mariners, I mean, they have to have a job to, to be there. Uh, you have to have a ship. You have to have some place for them to work. And in order for the ship to be in trade and the ship to be there, it has to have something to carry. It has to have cargo. So it begins with cargo. You'll hear the term cargo is king uh, repeated often. And that's the case. We have to have U.S. ships have to have access to cargo to carry. Um, and there's lots of cargo out there. I mean, there's a lot of stuff moving around. Um, but U.S. ships because of their operating costs, typically cannot uh, offer rates that are competitive with very highly subsidized foreign flag ships that can offer a much lower rate to move a container from you know, across the Pacific or you know, across the Atlantic or whatever. So uh, that begins to limit the amount of cargo that our ships can get their hands on. If they can't get their hands on the cargo, they don't stay under the US flag. When they're not under the U.S. flag anymore, there's not a place for those U.S. mariners to work. So it all kind of fits together. You know, we have to figure out how, how to get about 40 more ships under U.S. flag in order to make up, just to make up my problem, the those 1,800 mariners. Because it's about 22 people per ship, two crews, so that's about 44. So we need about, you know, 40, 45 ships or so to make up that, you know, 1,800 or so. Uh, people delta. So that's what we're working at is figuring out how to um, programs to get more cargo available to enable U.S. ships to be under the U.S. flag to carry people. And we've got several programs in place. I will tell you that this current administration is very focused on this. Uh, we have a lot of meetings uh, with White House staff on this. They, uh, they very much want to fix this problem which is very refreshing, it hasn't been that way in quite some time. So, uh, so I'm, I'm encouraged that we're gonna get to a solution. Like anything, it's gonna take longer than we want, but at least there's been acknowledgement and we're working on some things to get us there. Yes, sir. One last question. Yes, uh, I'm with the Teach Fleet. Um, I built the Lego model of the National Security multi It's right outside vessel. the office, my office door. Oh, it is? Okay. It is. I looked at it as before I walked over here today. Oh, okay. Awesome. Um, do you know what the, the latest is in terms of what's going to go on with the training ships for the uh, Maritime Academies um, and, and how that's going to factor into um, the disaster relief and that kind of thing as part of the, the mission of the maritime training ships in the future. Absolutely, great. So just for background for folks, uh, Congress has, uh, in, in FY18, so the budget that we're in right now, uh, has uh, authorized and appropriated $300 million to build this nation's first keel-up purpose-built training vessel uh, for our state maritime academies. Our six state maritime academies all use training ships to train their midshipmen, Kings Point, sends their midshipmen out into the U.S. flag fleet to train. They do a little bit different model. Uh, so uh, all of those ships, all of those training ships are really old. Uh, the Empire State New York Maritimes training ship is 56 years old. It's sister ship to the ship that I first went to sea on as a cadet, the Mormac Saga. Uh, so it's an old girl. She's starting to wear out. So we've got to replace her. The other ones are not far behind. So we, got, we came up with a design. Uh, of a training ship, a purpose-built training ship that will replace those uh, state maritime academy training ships. The model that uh, he was referring to, um, it's about a 600-foot ship. Uh, it can carry 600 midshipmen plus 100 instructors. Uh, it has a flight deck on it. It has a row-row deck on it. It has a 35-ton crane 
uh, back on the uh, stern area, bow thruster, stern thruster, uh, electric, electric drive, two segregated engine rooms, four diesels total. It's got a regular navigation bridge and a shadow bridge for training right underneath of it. Really well thought out, uh, excellent vessel that not only can do the training mission, but as we saw last fall down with uh, Hurricane Maria and Harvey and Isabel, it can do a humanitarian assistance and disaster relief mission also. That row row deck can carry a bunch of FEMA trucks and vehicles. Uh, it can carry 64 containers of, uh, of cargo. That crane can lift on and lift off all kinds of stuff. That helo deck can handle helicopters, rescuing people and moving supplies around. It's got an oversized medical ward on it that can be expanded into a small hospital. It's a very well thought out ship and we're gonna have these ships right now, money in the budget for the first one, which will replace the Empire State up in New York. Uh, the, the 19 uh, budget that was just um, authorized uh, two days ago by the president has money for the second one. Uh, we'll see if the uh, appropriators put money in as well. I believe that they will. So, you know, we'll be in the business of building two of them, hopefully, and hopefully several more, uh, which will be good news for American shipbuilding because they'll be U.S. built. They'll be Jones Act compliant ships. They'll be built with U.S. steel, uh, and they'll serve, you know, our U.S. interests and train our future U.S. mariners to hopefully start making up some of that 1800 uh Delta there. So ultimately, we'll hopefully get up to like four or five of them. Uh, and uh, it's a good news story. And we hope to award the contract uh, probably the f early part of next year uh, to actually start building them. So it's a good news story for the Merchant Marine, and we're very excited about it. So but thanks for the question. Please join me in thanking Mr. Busby. Thank you so much.